when you start to build Alice's yeah. time. I oh, thought maybe you'd start with Alice. Yeah. Sorry, are we on? Yeah, we're all good. Cool. Um, so yeah, so Allison, you had some questions last time we met just on um, schematics for like how you introduce the game. Mm -hmm. What's that? Introduce the game. Oh, the yes. Game. Sorry. Uh, Stoke Green School Board Finance Committee meeting on May 1st. Um, so the agenda for tonight, the only meeting for us today is May 1st, right? Um, so this is a continuation of the meeting we had last week where we went through the FY20 budget. Um, and we have some questions um, following that meeting and some of the line that we had on the agenda for February. One of them was on the inclusion specialist role, which didn't make it into the budget. Um, and we still have a chance to be discussing if there's a short impact of not having that reviewed or mm -hmm. uh, adding in. And then any updates that you may have on a numbers coming in this year. Uh, start there. Cool. Cool. I, I can let you know we had uh, half of our, conducted half of our uh, IEP meeting, so we have a CDS AC, so 15 uh, meetings to go. So I don't have um, any adjustments in um, the projections um, other than I think our number will not be 35 students that are coming in. We have um, two that have moved, three that are just going out a year because they had their age calls between July 1 and October 15th. Um, but uh, none of those students um, are the high impact students that I was going for with the uh, left. So I don't see a change in the need for a uh, special education teacher. Potentially a reduction if one of taxpayers was assessed at one end. But again, I don't have a half a meeting left to go. Um, in regards to the clerical position, you know, I've been, um, the staff has been piloting a model at Wentworth uh, using a, a current um, clerical uh, member and it's paying them for up to five additional hours. is not working as well as I thought it would because uh, just the nature of the job this person has, it doesn't allow them the flexibility to do scheduling, conversation, email communication, and that time throughout the day to spend with the, in our model of high school. Um, uh, that uh, IEP meeting is requiring more than five hours. It's sufficient if the expectation of paying overtime and that's not so, um, so though I was very hopeful that we would find a position that match was at the city's level because there's so much of the learning curve, knowing the people, and the you know, all that, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's actually going to happen. Um, I think if we get a situation where we really have to look critically at numbers, that can um, ideally sort of full-time work, but that can probably be cut and transition that position where we start to see what it is um, for next year, uh, which would basically give only seven hours for each of the three phases. The middle school, mo our high school model is working and that is in place and will continue on. Um, then uh, the last update, the main plan um, that is still very much uh, a moving target but we have received some back billing from an agency for a family who's willing to have seats and um, that has not been uh, the parents have, have not done what they've needed to do uh, and the support has been offered so I'm not sure that situation is going to change um, so the impact um, of that is actually a little bit more than the tuition is. So it's about $5,000 a month uh, addition to the tuition that we're already paying. That's um, so you'll see there's some discussion about accounting for that in the budget. That being said, um, a student who could become meaningfully eligible is going to get a back bill. And, and that could disappear, but it, it could not. 
Um, and we have uh, two other situations that um, also potentially uh, require us to uh, remitting consent. Uh, so there's many scenarios in that so complexity of many here. It is only billable per parent consent. And we have several different scenarios. We, we do pay related services, uh, main care related services for a student because in uh, private insurance is taxed before main care and it is impacting the family's annual allowance and transfer to the child. So they own having part of main care bills and they're paying part of it. So there's one scenario. Another scenario is a parent just doesn't want to do the application, so can't. Another scenario is a parent declines um, to go to uh, bill main care for their child. So we have all three scenarios going on right now. Um, Can you remind me for the for the what is what's the situation where somebody declines main care bill? Uh, and a variety of reasons. Um, it, it might impact my private insurance for my child, and they might pass. It, uh, they're on certain requirements to main care billing, and so they may not want to meet those requirements. Or the parent um, is dealing with the school to pay the bill. Are there any differences to the services that get provided that are not paid for by main care? Or that would that would not be allowable. Yeah, no. The services and services. Yeah. There, there is there is a lot of ongoing debate about main care. The CDS model still um, a lot of their budget is main care based. Public schools do use Goodwill, um, uh, Goodwill for related services, and there was a, an audit done, and the school districts were. Um, Received significant um, bills that were declined back. So they had to go back in order to get more services. Yeah, from because the you know, main care is a medical model, school is an educational model, and they're trying to get the two to communicate um, and come back to good prices. And so, amongst a lot of districts, have stopped billing because until there can be that clarity in that requirement, um, we. Uh, even had uh, the online system we use for our data, um, MSD. Uh, we paid them to maintain. There's a lot of annual trainings and write offs and service plans. There's a lot of requirements that go with main care billing. And uh, we were paying for support with compliance on that. And it was costing more than really what we were bringing in. So we stopped that then and did it and also ourselves. And then the school districts had significant financial compensation. And so a lot of us pulled out of doing any main care billing. And now there's a push by the state for, for us to do main care billing, but there's no guarantee. So I think it makes us very vulnerable. Um, so the U.S. district the one right in front of us is you couldn't have billed main care until you provided these services to the student. And if they turned us down on that, then later on they'd be up in here with the books and they'd say, oh, well, that wasn't really a required service. Or that person wasn't qualified to provide that service because they didn't have this certification or that certification. So, and eligibility is done on a monthly basis. So, uh, student eligibility. Student well. eligibility and changes monthly. Mm -hmm. So it's always a moving target, even if you're looking at it for revenue. So you've moved away from having Medicare revenue in a parent main care revenue in our budget. Back in the olden mm -hmm. days, um, when I first started making budgets, we actually had a revenue line in our general fund, mm -hmm. just like we have for the infusion or the mm -hmm. food safety or um, you know, these non tax revenues that were $200,000 a year. And we have state more. agencies. Um, and we we assumed that we would receive payment for services that were provided in districts. At this point, we've given up on that, and now what we're experiencing is some schools where they're just like, we're taking part of the school. We're sending students out to the schools. And right now, the only piece we're talking about is an out-of-district student, where that school, the private school, 
might be relying on Medicare income and not really not fulfilling that for some of the services because they didn't get any money from anyone. So if they don't get the money from any payer, they're going to turn around and say, oh, hey, there's a new school, we're on Medicare. That's exactly the situation that we're in. It's just our eyes are just too wide. Uh, it's not up proportionately from last year, but it is a significant loss. What we've got for the full city, um, based on that new conversation, is that in this term of art, if we there's a line or two that we need to increase our out of district tuition line to be able to accommodate and build some additional services that wouldn't necessarily be just the tuition, um, which is I would probably a little bit cursory. Yeah. Um, so when we were building line for first reading there was a lot of fear that we were not getting any service or what our expectation um, for the coming year and what the vacation rate are likely to be. And special education receives a significant grant in money, local entitlement, um, but federal money can't be used to pay to sustain federal money so uh, we can't use any of our local entitlement to offset these potential additional charges that we're getting. So this sixty thousand dollars is for three students, for um, one student at our charter school. Right, the one student who is currently right at this moment in the situation where the some or the charter school isn't able to build any care. I just sent out the bills that I have to mention the, a the average is five thousand dollars a month for those additional services. We were already paying tuition for this child, but we weren't paying for all the additional medical services, which because they were getting money from Medicare. Um, so our estimate is for this one kid who is currently in the situation, um, if we had to pay $5,000 a month for 12 months, that's what that would look like. And typically these programs are not a 10 month program, they're a very year long program. Very year long. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, potentially we would look we could look at our out of district line and actually double that mm -hmm. if in fact this situation happened in all of our out of district students, if, if that was the cost of the program. So what what you see is would be built because so far families have been eligible and allowing the other schools to build for the child. And pretty much every family with a child with significant Disabilities significant enough to require special services would be eligible. Yeah, it's not income dependent. Yeah. And, and you said this is back running, so the six thousand in next year's budget would cover this year. No, uh, there are with budget. I mean, we are already having to absorb because we receive you know the cash bill and and, and I'm trying to explain that to you. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to project and allow for this situation hasn't resolved itself in, the, in potential it may not. So if it continues, what the hedge fund is would be the, the, the hedge fund kind of cost. Mm -hmm. And I think what Allison was saying was that if the situation were to change, and you know, this is one of those, we're budgeting for something that's an unknown, um, like almost everything else in blood. If the situation were to change and the private school were now able to bill Medicare again, um, then they could back bill Medicare Medicare for services up to the point where the parent was eligible. So we might find some relief in that if the parent then goes out and you know, does what needs to be done to be eligible for Medicare again. Um, but it's it's uh, just another little wrinkle to the out of district tuition line because they're notoriously difficult to work anyway because students come, students go, and the um, need for services that can't be met in the district a very volatile um, situation in, in, in a good, good year without Medicare intervening. Mm -hmm. we, we have low numbers for out of district placements because it's one of it's our kids in their home school. But you know there are obviously situations where if a, a student requires more, you know, two on one, two class to, per student, then we're really looking at the dollar fee and capability and how the school spends or if the behavior is so disruptive 
to the working environment on a consistent basis. Um, so I think that we'll always have the knowledge of this. We also are safe in buildings to find our ability to develop um, more programs in those working environments. Yeah. But that aside, even the most some of these students require very it's not the appropriate space for programming. And I think, you know, kudos to Allison and her staff that they're able to keep so many of our kids in here because they provide adequate and appropriate, well-designed programs for them. And I think you mentioned, Allison, when you were talking about in the budget workshop, I think it was, that the behavior specialists that we've added have been instrumental in that piece because they're working one-on-one -on -one with teachers and, you know, picking the pace of the child and figuring out what kind of accommodations and programming and, and also potentially tools. could be increasing lesson completion with yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because it, it, it fits. Um, so in keeping students here and keeping students in, you know, what is called the least restrictive environment, but keeping them in their general education setting for as much as possible, um, that requires a lot of work. It requires looking at how to modify curriculum, how to implement accommodations, how to potentially look at post developing co-teaching classrooms, um, how to look at assistive tech universal design for learning, assistive technology, many complexities. And so right for the last few years we've been contracting out with an inclusion specialist um, for a couple of students uh, to enter a program to um, help them be able to access as much special edu regular education by being educated with their peers, um, but it has required looking at the curriculum and impacting it, modifying it, um, adjusting, you know, it down uh, many levels, but still developing ways that they're working with their peers, contributing an equal measure We also use that person to do some school-wide training, and the inclusion is to certify a belief that they're something that's not um, up, oh, up again. I'm, <laughs> I could, I you should go on, on so a lot about, about this, but do it. in this <laughs> vein, I'm talking just special education programming as an inclusion specialist, mm -hmm. but to me, the word inclusion is, is so much more. And that so much more part is how we use this consultant to do preschool-wide trainings at Butler School and Middle School last year, because inclusion is all about just feeling connected, feeling an equal member, um, focusing on what you're, what do we have in common, not how are we different. And so, so that is not um, anything. I mean, it can have to do with the disability, but it can also have have to do with what you look like or what accent you are. You know, so, so many things. So when we're looking at kids with um, disabilities, whether it's in some type of cognitive disability or their attention or their social pragmatic language or their, right, their interfering behavior, their executive functioning skills, just being able to concentrate and not disrupt or, or get their thoughts on paper. There's just so many ways inclusion can be supported, but it takes professional development time with general ed and special ed. It takes time for that team to meet on a regular basis and look, okay, what's the next unit coming ahead? How do we need to adapt that? How do we need to um, uh, create, get, get that story written for the levels below, but they still have the same content knowledge. Um, how do you teach elect an electricity unit, you know, that's the seventh grade, you know, science, mm -hmm. in a way that the student will really get some true learning from it and carry it on. Um, I also think the inclusion specialist um, would, could be critical in doing co-teaching, especially at the high school, you know, where kids are growing through. And um, I would love to see someone be able to model and teach uh, staff ways to 
unpack a curriculum so that they can modify it. S strategies that can naturally include students of all different learning styles and abilities. And I think co-teaching would be a great way to model that, um, as well as the professional development for meeting with that team. Uh, right now, those meetings usually occur like every two weeks, but they're pulling in speech, a speech therapist, an OT therapist, a behavioral specialist, a social worker, the gen ed teacher, the special ed teacher. So these are, you know, lots of things with moving parts. So um, I think the inclusion specialist would be the leader, would be a trainer, would um, get some consistent strategies and protocols in place that can be transferred to different classes and content area. Um, our special education teachers don't, and our general education teachers, they don't have really three hours a week to do this curriculum programming that some of our students are taking if to do this well. Um, so looking at more efficiencies and also building teachers' toolboxes and staff toolboxes. Um, and, and so time, you know, here's this balance of do we have enough time to give our own staff to develop this versus bringing in kind of the trainer trainer model, an expert who can then help develop these skills. Um, so the, the reason why I, I was really interested in talking about this is because of the numbers of, for incoming students. Um, because I, I mean, I think it's the right thing to do. I mm -hmm. mean, but I also wondered, you know, knowing that intervention, early intervention leads to the the best outcomes. Do you know of any research about inclusion and what the outcomes are for students who, who have early inclusion at the primary school level and what that would mean for like, you know, the high school level um, in terms of their programming? So uh, um, that's an interesting question. I'll probably answer it a couple of different ways. Um, yes, when you think of uh, uh, early intervention, there's so many studies about how early intervention does create more positive outcomes it, um, like uh, in speech and language. You know, there are a lot of areas that early intervention really matters and really makes a difference and those <coughs> students close the gap much quicker. When you're talking about a student who has an intellectual disability, that cognitive gap is never gonna mm -hmm. be closed. Um, so it's almost more for me, a social emotional issue of the inclusion of peers, of being part of a community, of feeling valued, of knowing they have their place, they're one of them. Um, and, and just like any other student, those are their classmates that they grow up with. Um, so in that regard, starting right off the bat, yes. But I, I think in some ways, and I think some parents might not agree with me, but Structurally, uh, certainly at K2, inclusion is a lot um, easier because there's such a range of developmental needs uh, within the classroom mm -hmm. and the flexibility of those even pre-academic and academic skills in such a huge range. It becomes much harder socially to integrate and develop those true friendships and, and that ability to participate in a meaningful level in the higher grades. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, while I'm not at all minimizing, you know, this is a K-12 need, this is a school, a community need, one person, one inclusion specialist cannot do it all. Right. Um, so I would actually be focusing on position on middle school and high school. Oh, you would start there. I thought we were starting at eight corners. Uh, at eight corners, it's for the special education teacher to be the member. Mm -hmm. But the inclusion specialist, um, I would focus, I think uh, the curriculum and demands and the strategies for really fully integrating and feeling part of the community is harder, um, socially, behaviorally, and cognitively in middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. I think our middle school has done a lot of work with it. Uh, we have uh, special education class next year, um, but 
the high school have, has room to grow. You know, they are very much a department model. You know, this is going to be brand new for them. Not that we haven't had very disabled students involved in, in classes um, to varying degrees. We certainly do. Um, but to do it through a co-teaching and a true inclusion experience, we do not have that. So you're the expert, but I guess what I was envisioning is um, sort of starting to get the most bang for a buck right from the beginning because like let's say you have a child with emotional disturbance. Mm -hmm. If if we start to include them early, will they be will there be a great greater likelihood that with more um, in, intense supervision or intense programming that they, that they'll be um, have greater chances of success as they get older and as they move through the curriculum and so we'll, so I mean twofold I mean yeah. one is because I'm really interested in that and think obviously agree with mm -hmm. with the concept but also from a, an efficiency perspective yeah. is there a way for a long term efficiency with that so. Um, so there's, I think there's still a disconnect in how I'm, I'm probably explaining this. At K2, most of the students are included for most of their day in Gen A. Um, and so that's where you're looking at the level of adult support okay. we provide at the K2 level because those students are in with their peers most of the time. Um, and that's the staffing impact we feel at K2. We also, that is the first place where, um, that's where our first behavioral specialist began for those reasons. I mean, K2 students are very good at regulating their behaviors or their emotions and really giving them tools to do that so that they can stay with their class. Um, so bang for the buck, that's where we started with our behavior interventions. And um, also with the whole academic support model uh, the gen ed support model. So I, I would, most of our special ed kids, they're more mainstream the younger they are mm -hmm. okay. than necessarily the older they get. Um, so that, that, that's that, that helps. Helps. Yeah. And so I, there's like a knowledge and a skill gap at our upper grades with the staff yeah. that this person would really be helping to fill mm -hmm. or helping to cultivate a culture where folks are working towards that. Yeah. And, it's really exciting um, what the middle school has done this year with unified sports and the leadership summit and you know all the, culturally they're really embracing a lot of those things and, um, and we have to kind of grow that up. Yeah. I think the, the point's really good Allison and that the inclusion specialist feels to me like it's um, when you get into the higher grades and things are more rigorous it's it's more uh, less about behavior and social emotional than it is about adapting the curriculum so that a child can be successful. I think it's that, but it's also yeah. the social piece. The social piece. Right. There is well, you already have like a social divide that you need to solve, right. but it's also that the, the programming is more complex. Right? Correct, and there, um, you know, the academic rigor right. um, and um, there's academic rigor K through 12. I don't mean to imply that but their learning standards and um, you know it's more the level of modification it gets is wider. Yeah. 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 It gets become wider. So you said that you had contracted to some extent for inclusion we assistance. Did. When we, was that and we um, have been oh it might be no it's been um, a lot longer. Um, uh, maybe four years now we've been doing it. Uh, so currently we're doing it? Currently we're doing it, but the person we're contracting with has moved, um, and so they aren't as accessible, and so they come down once a month. Uh, and, but prior to that, uh, the person moved in the Portland area, and so we have more time. Who was it before him? It's always been uh, who we're currently using. Yeah. So now she's uh, a professor.
that's why the farm that has moved in, has moved and relocated. What grades has she been? Uh, uh, three through eight. And what's that cost for? Oh, I paid for it out of local entitlement. It hasn't been in the uh, local budget. I've been using grant funds, using grant funds for that. And then um, we did some shared cost savings when we did the school wide training. Right. We I also think what we use some of the competing money. We also she we also had to run summer programs for new teams of students that are coming up and open that up to I think two summers ago there were twenty two staff members that participated. Now we do three half day sessions. So, um, but right now, given her availability, it's really more focused on certain IEP students rather so than the general. So, if we were able to fund this position, um, could we put count on any of that money to offset the cost? Well, it's in our unexpected line under local entitlement. So it, there isn't a particular number to it because uh, just like with our audiology, our Northeast speech and hearing, if we have to do an independent evaluation with a psychiatrist or psychologist, there's this pool of money that we call for unexpected services. So it's for usually, contract usually that we contracted out. services yeah. for a specific kid need that might arise that we hadn't budgeted for. Right. Um, so I think what you're saying is would we save money by hiring a person and or be able to use some of the money that we're currently spending on consultant right um, the fact that it's in the grant would mean that you could but you can't fund a portion of the position through the grant but you then wouldn't be and you wouldn't be assured that the, those grant funds would continue year after year we don't know what the grant allotment is we probably won't know until the end of june um, it's a significant so Generally, the grant is over six hundred thousand dollars, and I think um, people don't realize that as large as the special education budget is in the local fund, it doesn't pay for a lot of things. Um, it doesn't pay for several of our key positions. It doesn't pay for any of our equipment, uh, our supplies, our um, professional development. Uh, we have small lines in the local, but there's a significant, uh, over half the grant is in personnel. Um, and then it's these unexpected services. Uh, sometimes if, if we just had an out of district placement, let's say right now, I would carry that through in the, in the um, grant money for a year until we could roll it in. You know, so there's until all- we've had time yeah. to budget for it. So mm -hmm. there's all different ways that grant money is utilized so, so did we say eighty thousand for that? I think it would be position. a professional position slot, mm -hmm. which you're saying is eighty thousand. Right, and we didn't actually have it as a, you know, that we didn't have mm -hmm. it on our investment list. It was sort of a, you know, we also talked about list, um, but I would budget it at the eighty thousand, which would be um, somewhat under the teacher contract. That's the way that our behavior specialists are. They're considered teachers, and they're professional staff. Professional mm -hmm. staff. So is that a no? Is that a no about? I mean, I heard you say like, uh, is there money? Uh, I, I, there isn't yeah. any money in the in the local budget in the general fund budget. No, you're asking if it could if a percent of it could be. Uh, I could say if, uh, most likely it's a no because I think our main we're vulnerable with our main care, mm -hmm. and so we may have to shift costs. Mm -hmm. To pick that main care up in the local, flip other things over to local entitlement since they can't be used to be same thing. So I, I'm hesitant. Um, number we, one, because we don't know the figure. And number two, we should fund it. We know we're. Um, <laughs> but if, if I we know. Well, so then just the other question well, is: the well, one year could right. start. So the then time. the other question is: I understand that this person that we have been contracting with is, has moved. Uh, no, actually, the so other so then so, would so then how would we hire someone? Well, in the sense of we've used two. No, I don't. I don't, I don't mean to be flat. No, I, don't I, mean I, I understand <laughs> why it's that general. Is there, there, right? is there, there is another specialist in New Hampshire that families have used for independent evaluations, and they have come to the school and presented and worked with us. 
I don't know of another specialist who bills themselves at the level of expertise that these two people do. I think it is, Maine is emerging into kind of the inclusion. For example, we had, a, there was a, a phone consultation with our inclusion specialists and some of our high school staff with uh, a high school in Phil with a school system in Philadelphia about how they do inclusion. I mean, that's where we're going to look. You know, other states, Massachusetts, Philadelphia. So we should look to move to Maine. So I think, you know, we're, we'd be looking at someone who has experience co-teaching, who mm -hmm. has experience with uh, universal design for learning, who has experience as a, te a, a strategist. And uh, hiring someone, even if they don't have all of the experience, once you own them, you can groom them and grow them if they're committed to the district, which is really different than trying to find someone who's willing to come and provide some contracted mm -hmm. services right. on a, a limited or mm -hmm. scattered basis. Right. Is, is this rule only effective if it's full time? Like, what if it was a, a twenty five a week? It's a starting time. It's right. just a matter of can you recruit can someone, you yeah. someone for half time? Yeah. Half -time. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and you I never know. It's a specialized role, right? But, yeah. um, and sometimes, well, are there other things that they could do as well, right? So, if, if after that, I'm just trying to be creative with mm -hmm. um, I'm not undervaluing the position mm -hmm. uh, at all. But if it was only half time funded for that and half time funded where they had need elsewhere, um, I suppose that all depends. I would harder to hire for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you, you never know. Some people want the part-time job. Yeah. Some people want to be paid as a contract service provider as a part-time job because their rate is much higher. Mm -hmm. um, you, you just never know. We, we have had, um, it's been surprising, Some depending on different times of year when we advertise. Um, there's a lot of people relocating to Maine, so we're tapping that resource as well. Thing that you said that stuck with me was the train the trainer because mm -hmm. I everything that you've talked about over the course of the last few weeks this trend we only see it seems like a trend right that's going up correct and so um, the more educated and support I mean, the more support we can provide to our teachers um, for really really dope we'll be more effective in our years from now um, so it truly is an investment it just mm -hmm. is whether or not that investment this year. Right. What you might, and I, this is just a total brainstorm, you might think about like, can we send a team of teachers to some really high quality conferences and try to build capacity in that way? Because we could do that for a fraction of the cost of hiring a person. It's not the same thing. You don't get the same return on investment. Just think of Monique's chart that she had in the instructional coach's presentation. Um, there'd still have to be coaching and someone kind of making sure that that work is happening and embedded, so. So, I, I mean, that certainly is a valuable resource, but that is hard because if we focus, let's say, just on the high school, um, it's, what gen ed team are you gonna send? Are you gonna send mm -hmm. a team, from one from each major discipline who's currently working with the student? Mm -hmm. Um, and then they'll never have that teacher again. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I was piggybacking off the turnkey yeah. idea. It wouldn't yeah. be, the intent wouldn't be that you go and keep the knowledge. Oh, know. right, but. I just, I think that we should really try to figure out a way to put something, I, I, I think that it's something that we need to start seriously talking about, and I'd love to figure out a way to try to put something into the budget for I think if we looked at it as a part-time position, I would have a person just focused at the high school. Can, can I ask you another question? When you came in, you first said you've attended half of the CDS meetings for, for incoming students, for Kin kindergartners. Right, that are already in special education. Are all of your referrals coming from CDS? Uh, yes, because for kindergarten, right. because those students are already on an IEP meeting. I don't go to it any other student like oh because they're not that. flagged unless if CDS has already flagged them correct right. meaning the number could come go up after they've started yes we still uh, it will go up that's, that's a guarantee there are always there are students that are in referral at CDS right now that um, 
if they qualify, even though they're currently not identified, they will, could be before kindergarten starts. Um, but the number will increase. So CDS only screens those kids who have been referred prior to pre-K and they they've sought out their, their services, right? Correct. But so there's gonna be kids that have not received that. Yeah. And we have, uh, in I think part of the proposal you heard at K2, we have maybe, um, Students who haven't been in a preschool or things like that, they, they haven't been referred, but they come in with a huge amount of need. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're referred rather quickly, but it really does tax general ed you know, resources mm -hmm. because they're students that should have been receiving early intervention right. services. But until but they're formally identified as needing an IEP, right. they're considered general That's education, right. and so right. you have to find the resources to support them yeah. that way. When are you current? You said you're halfway through. When, when um, finish? And yeah, and, well, um, the day after first and second meeting. Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I think next week is a, a, a big week, but um, there's one that happens after the 16th. But I think most of them are done the day of the 16th. They will be done on the day of the 16th. And you and I were taking a look at it. Yeah. Again, I'm potentially if we could reduce by one at tech. In regards to the CDS meetings, that's where I think that there is a, a potential bud budget change if we could reduce the ed tech count down by one. Um, when will we know that? Uh, the tw uh, probably the sixth. Well, <laughs> yeah, and and what May, May, in, yes, in a couple of weeks. But you know, I, I could find out something next week if if um, uh, a, a student, student think is coming within that. Is correct. That? Correct. Yeah. You know, so, and I think you know it does go without saying that um, it's only a phone call away, literally, that things change in special education. Mm -hmm. You know, a family moves here, and things like that. So yeah, we just it's just our our this spring, and the reason that we were able to do that was because that we had breakage in the budget because we had to personal turnover. But even yeah. if we didn't Constant. have breakage, we we'd would still, still be doing have to it. provide it. Right, we'd have to find it somewhere else. Freeze an account or, you know. So hypothetically speaking. Yes. If everything stays as it is today. Correct. And you think you'd go without an ed tech that would reduce us from the ask of nine to eight, which is 45,000, which is half of the increased mass. So instead of just getting rid of the ed tech, we could buy like a half time or freeze an account. Potential option. Creative. Um, and you don't necessarily have to make a hire immediately. And do you feel like we're ready for that? I mean, mm. if, if that if that was budgeted for, our students are ready for it. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, this is... Our need is there. Yeah, right. Our need is apparent. We have... <coughs> uh, this work has to be done this year at the high school because of, uh, of the population we have. So... This will have that work be much more powerful and inclusive to all. I think staff will feel more supported. Um, it's still a huge change. It's a big learning curve. As Allison said, it's a mindset. So it's a complete shift from um, maybe what they have been thinking is best for students. But you know, we know more, so we have to do better with what we know now. And, and the high school staff is really receptive. Uh, Every, everyone is really receptive, but they want the training. They, they need want to understand to do it well. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think adult support is only as good as we can train them and teach them how to do the job. Well, that's interesting. But what if we did start in December? Um, yeah, I mean that's certainly a thing that that we do in budgets. Um, we haven't, we, haven't, August. <laughs> we, we haven't typically done it because we're, you know, we're on a school year basis. It's very common on the town side, or I should say common on the town side, where if they're starting a position, they might start it halfway through the year, mm -hmm. so that it's not such an impact in the first year of the budget, and then they can plan for it the second year of the budget. Um, and you know, Julie's right, it, it, it does change your planning if you're bringing someone on board for a school situation. Um, we had it harder to hire. Yeah, it goes back to the recruitment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I guess I would just be interested to know if we did that, if we even if we put it out for half, if we're going to put it in the budget. Again, speaking hypothetically, is it is it even money that might be higher? And that, that I wouldn't there's some sort of we don't know. Um, you would say discovery exercise. Yeah, okay. You put it out like an education week in school spring and like a broader. Well, I, I think our. I think people do access our serving school, mm -hmm. our main site, because um, we have many future applicants from out of state or. Um, There's still a popular with those students. Yeah. Well, I would think that that would be such an exciting challenge for somebody in that field. I also, you know, uh, our person that we work with right now may have some, some recommendations mm -hmm. of people that are that she's aware of or that she's worked with. And, she might help us network. Thank you. Ms. Allison. Okay. I, I know. Thank you. Yeah, that was helpful. I'm sorry. These are difficult conversations. <laughs> well, no, but they have to happen. It's yeah. just um, they're not definitive. You know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of gray there. And then we want to do the best by our kids. So. And we have competing needs when it comes to a budget. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, 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 Okay, we're going to go through our list now. Let's go through the list or should we go through the questions? Um, I, think well, I think the list would be really quick. Okay, um, just to point out what I've messed with. Um, the last time we sat together, we had uh, three items down, we had included an increase in the employer share for main PERS, and I didn't note this, but this is for the PLD, which is the, the it stands for participating local district, but it means the municipal side, not the teacher side. Um, and the good news on that is that I reached out to main PERS because I was getting conf conflicting information from them. I was getting information that they were proposing to increase the employer's costs, but then they just sent me something that said, oh, your cost is 10%, which is what I had budgeted for. So long story short, I reached out to them and said, what the heck? And the, the answer was, yes, we are planning to increase the employer share, but not in FY20. We want to do it incrementally. So what we have in the budget is currently sufficient for our needs. And so that's changed from a, an, an add of like $8,000 to a zero. Um, the next thing down just below that first yellow block is that debt service costs came in. You see my note says that Ruth provided an actual cost of 111272 for, um, this is for the bond issue that they're currently preparing to be issued this month. Um, and it would be principal and interest on the school's portion of the funding that's being raised. This number adds 41,272 to what I put in the original proposal because I had estimated only $70,000 for this year. I have exact figures for the prior years because they're done and they're closed and we know what our costs are. So the only estimated piece was for what we hadn't done yet. Um, and I've added the 41,272, but this just happened today, and Ruth is actually going back and forth with the bond council to try to refine that, to try to make sure that we have the best possible price tag for FY20. And so that would be, um, in my understanding, that would be the most of an increase that we would have, but it's going to be a town-wide conversation because the town also has the same issue. They've yeah. got um, the debt, sir, the debt um, payments will be for CIP projects being funded on both the town and the school side. So uh, when we sit with the council next week, they may have already had some conversations about it. Um, and I think this number is going to shift, and I think it's going to shift downward, but I wanted to put the post number in there. Um, then the next, the second yellow blob is also new. Um, I reached out to Pass and Westbrook Hoke to find out whether we really actually needed to have anything in our budget, and I think I said this a lot at our last meeting, that um, because the state started funding the CTE schools directly just this year, this is the first year it's happened, and in the initial conversations, 
both Pats and Westbrook said, if the state under the EPS formula doesn't give us everything that we need to run our programs, we're still gonna be allowed to and will reach out to the sending schools and ask y'all to pay your share of the, the programming that's not covered by state funding. Um, so this year we've had no bills from them. Um, and so I reached out and said, hey, you know, you guys have your budget together for next year. Are you anticipating that you'll have sufficient subsidy to cover your costs? And the answer that I got from Pats was, as long as the EPS or the subsidy amounts that are out there right now don't change, then they're all set. They don't need us. I haven't heard back from Westbrook, um, but I did just do this, you know, within the last week. So um, I'm assuming they'll answer in a similar way. So what I did was I just took it and cut it in half and figured it. But there could be double. It could be uh, minus nine thousand if if both of them say to me, "Yeah, we're we're good." Um, and the I, I did it very. Um, the the nine thousand is actually a, a rational calculation. It's based on what our proportion was of the prior year's um, bills for those two schools um, when we were paying them directly, and um, it's a proportionate value of what they call their part two budget, which is um, usually capital projects and equipment, but it was the area where they felt like they might not get full funding from the state, and that that was the one place. They weren't so worried about their operating budget because they felt like the state was gonna be able to cover that for them. Um, then our next yellow blob, you'll see an ad of 60,000, which is what we just talked about with the main care situation. Um, so we, we used to have a minus sign in front of total LC adjustments. Now we have a plus sign. <laughs> so about the 60,000 is a reduced clerical support position. And that's there as like a question mark because we knew that Allison yeah. was gonna join us this evening. And um, I mean, we, we could still say, this team could say, wow, you know, we really gonna have to find some place to cut some week. money, so could we make that position a point six? Allison just expressed very eloquently, I think that she could use a full-time position and she'd prefer that. But she also understands that if it's a pressure point and we need to find some money, that she would rather have you know, a full-time than a part-time, but she would make do with what she gets. So can you remind me, because I, I, I don't remember where this reduction is. I think it's a compliance code thing here, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. So it's in the adjustment. Okay. Okay. So it would be a reduction to the proposed investment. And so it's budgeted at 45, right? So we, if we said we wanted to make it not a full-time position, then we wouldn't take out the whole 45, but we might take out a portion of it. Um, so that it's still on the list as a sort of, you know, if, we're, if we need to make a decision, then that's a place we could look. Um, and so what Allison said was minimally three days, but preferred five. So it right. could be an $18,000 reduction if you go from a So 0. 0.6 6 of the $45,000. So that's a central office position? No, it's. Um, that's not the Wentworth one that she was talking about, is it? I don't know where this person would physically be housed, um, but it would be a, a clerical position. District wide special education is what she's talking okay. about. Um, the person who would be responsible for doing the so it would be a point six of a forty five thousand dollar right budget if that's what we <coughs> said which would is eighteen thousand dollars no eighteen thousand would be the reduction yeah, yeah. So yeah. in that yellow box you'd have eighteen thousand um, and I think Alicia if that you she, did that um, Allison mentioned Wentworth because that was one of the places where she was trying to use existing staff yeah and okay. ask them to pick up some hours to do. Um, some of this work that needs to get done, and I think that it becomes to, well, what she's experiencing is that it becomes kind of piecemeal and there's not enough time in the day for them to do it consistently right. and to be a true point person because it's sort of tacked on to their already Plus um, it's a very technical role, and so even when Allison was going to pilot this, I was sort of skeptical, if I could be honest, because it's not something, it's kind of like doing data analysis like you can't just like walk away and like oh take a phone call and then get right back to it right so there's a loss of efficiency but also effectiveness and um, there's so many very specific deadlines and things like that when it comes to the compliance aspects that having somebody who really like that's their focus um, 
is going to be the most efficient way to do it. Is there another part-time, or is there a part-time position that is more, um, that could be more structured in the day rather than you know picking up the phone or whatever this work work person is doing mm -hmm. that it could be combined with? Is there another position that we're looking at that? I think this was the position that you were looking at and saying, hey, maybe with some of, like, maybe your spare time, which appears to be spare time, plus a maximum five. of five additional okay. hours, yeah. could you do this job? And what we've learned is that no, that okay. does not work. Or is not working well. And some of you would hire to do the cooking specialist. She's not the same type of person that would use this up. Totally different pay grade. Yeah. Um. There's no new asks <coughs> that we could reduce each a little bit. <coughs> Somebody that would be more structured, more, um, I guess, analytical or something. Yeah. Investments. Yeah. Um, no, because really the only other things you have are teaching positions outside of the HR specialist role. Um, and again, I think it's just a matter of. Do you want to do two things halfway, or do you want to do one thing well? Like, mm -hmm. I want to make a process thing, so I don't know how it's going to be received. But I'm going to say it anyway. Um, we got this list of very detailed priorities from the Leadership Council, and Inclusion Specialist is listed under other proposed investments deferred to FY21 future planning. Mm -hmm. So while I think it's obviously something that Allison needs and our <coughs> kids need, there ha there must have been a reason behind that being its place in our packet. And so I'm a little confused, if I'm being honest, why all of a sudden this one position is being singled out and kind of elevated to a talking point for us at this point. Well, because I asked for it to be. I mean, I think it's important given the numbers, and it's but so the numbers that you're talking about are the numbers of the K two, mm -hmm. which is she said it wouldn't. That's not where she's put right. I understand that, and but that's why I asked for it, and I just think that we need to start having that discussion. I think that um, that's a valuable position, and and that's that's something I want to talk about trying to include in the budget. So you may disagree with me, but well, that's why. it's not that that's I disagree, why. it's just we are reprioritizing our prioritized list. Well, we, we, we did. are, because we haven't made any decision yeah. yet. We didn't, so we didn't, we, well, this is our chance to, I mean, mm -hmm. this was the Leadership Council's prioritization, and, and we have the same ability to say, we think that there are things that are important too, and so that's my effort at, at Exploring that. It's not a criticism. I just I don't I don't take it as one. But I'm just okay. answering your question. Is you said how did how did we do that? And that's my understanding of how that happened. And, and I think it's, sadly, okay. I would say that I think many of the things that fall low on the list are because we're in such a place <coughs> and we've been in such a place of what's the critical need yeah. um, that you know, this year, we really pushed the Leadership Council to say, we want proposals for everything that you need, where in the years past, they would not even be talking about it because they just said, no, it's not going to get in the budget. But we believe that what this does is helps our community understand, um, you know, what, not only what the process is, but these are things that need attention. I mean, if Ann Legage, or Ann Lovejoy was sitting here, she'd tell you this RTI right, position is like oxygen for her right. school. So. It's hard, but unfortunately, yes. part of our decision making is well, it's something we don't currently have. How do we support what we currently have? Like the kids who need to take STEM classes at the high school, there's, right. you know, that, and we don't have a teacher for that. Right. Um, and it's, it's not a good place to be. It's, it's not, doesn't feel good for the leadership team to make that list right. either. So and just we've said this a few times that there, the, there's a reason why all of these proposals exist because the leadership team said, we need these things. And then, you know, if it were up to us and we had an infinite amount of resources, we'd be doing all the things. So, it's, as Julie said, it's, you know, it's trying to decide what can we... <laughs> when they go around and present their proposals, it's each person individually, remember, um, like the whiteboard gets to rank um, They're all required, high, high, medium, yeah. or low. 
and everyone at first when they're just doing their own you know department or school it's high to medium high and then once they hear the k-12 conversation things like the hr specialist which we had low but high in our minds but low comparative they said no that actually needs to go to high so it's after they hear the k-12 perspective right and which i feel is like we've, we you know we we have heard a lot of the k-12 perspective at this point like and it is hard like when when people from each department present and they and they you know tell their their compelling needs it's really hard to then go back to the sheet and just be black and white about the numbers like, yeah. there's well no because question. there's nothing frivolous there right. there's nothing where you're going right. oh geez well you know that's a nice idea but well it's really it really speaks to how much they value the whole organization yeah and then they're able to buy on yeah, yeah other people's needs absolutely yeah. yeah there's sometimes there's a little crying but oh, gosh <laughs> try to try to get through the next couple mm -hmm. weeks without any more crying there's definitely teamwork all right, let's go back to the sheet. Back to the sheet. Okay, so um, the second ch chunk is SBFC discussion slash decision points. I've added a uh, $5,000 amount there under strategic planning because we currently have um, $15,000 budgeted in that line. And I think that really the only thing that we'd be looking to do with that money in the coming year would be to further the superintendent search. There are other things we've used it for in the past. Um, but you know that's kind of job one. Uh, but I understand that we may be looking at more like a twenty dollar or twenty thousand dollar price tag than a fifteen. Um, and that's that was so right. that was based off of um, the long years of the play. Is that was not a decision that we have made as a board? Um, but it was it came up in conversation um, about. To have the opportunity to explore other well, vendors. So, my understanding was that when we realized that we were going to hire an interim, we knew then that we would need additional money for a superintendent search. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that that meant we would need twenty thousand dollars budgeted. It, I mean, I understand what you're saying that okay. there are. There are vendors that it would be that much money. Um, are we saying we want to keep our options open for that much money for potentially? I think that's what Leanne thought that she heard. Yeah. Uh, a loss. We need to talk about loss. Or you, if, as you reflect on the a la carte sort of menu choices that we made, were there other things that now you're like, oh, we really should also do this? Well, I knew that. I knew that still we thought have maybe been, that would have been a little bit better, but it still would have been about eight. Yeah. Okay, let's take that from you. But but yeah. <laughs> well, I think, do you think that we should clarify that? I, I mean, that's just a board decision right. that we need to either, mm -hmm. um, so we can potentially measure it. We can see if we can make an estimate or make a call. So this is at 15,000 currently? That's right. And what has that been, what, like, what was that, has that been spent on historically? Other um, than it's really dependent on, on the goals of the district in a given year. Um, we've used it for data analysis, we've used it for the enrollment study. Um, it's really kind of a, it's just a contracted services line, but it's a contracted services in, this, in the service of strategic planning more so than instruction. We um, used it for organizational the firm planning. that did the study and survey and yeah. analyzed the data so that we had a neutral third party. Mm -hmm. um, also, if we need any studies done as you're looking at long range planning needs, mm -hmm. if we need to do any. There's already a $10,000 line in we put We put some money into facilities for that, that. and that is that is still you know, a place that that's a new piece. Yeah. Um, and that, that grew out of the fact that we weren't really able to use the capital budget planning line in the same way that we expected um, if we didn't have it connected to a specific project. That's come up in, the, in recent years. Mm -hmm. okay, so I actually didn't want those building. I think we do need to discuss as a board yeah. potentially a, a, a retreat. What are our priorities? And you know, twenty thousand dollars is a lot for one project for one yeah. search. But if it, yeah. we don't end up using somebody that would cost that much, then actually can we reduce this significantly if that's all that that's budgeted for? If there's nothing else that in the next year we're going to be spending. Right. And 
So the question on that one there. would be like a timing question, but you know, sometime between now and you only spend what you need no matter what when it comes to the budget. So we don't mm -hmm. spend it just because it's there. We only I know, but what you can't do is add money to the budget after. I understand that. that. <laughs> we we still need to be responsibly budgeting and right. to, to the voters. You, know, you don't want to just sort of say, oh well, I don't we wanna, might yeah we right. might need it at right. every right. There's if, there's, a, there's, yeah. <laughs> if there's a if there's a significant. Um, yeah. Agreement that the, that you're going to do something that might have a twenty thousand dollar price tag. That's a different conversation. Because I think we, it's likely that we would save no more than ten. That we would save. That we would say it, we only need ten. I agree. I agree. Right. I agree. And that's that's over the path. Mm -hmm. Very little, but. Um, and that's the difference between MSMA and. Um, so it sits there as a topic of discussion still. I mean, none of these things are decided. They're just out there so that we can remember that we talk about them and change them at will. So we'll take that, that action away and try to get that on the agenda for a future Saturday. Um, do you want me to delete the line, or do you want me to just, just leave it on there for now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay, I do think we should move the reduced clerical position question mark down to school board decision. Yeah. I'm not hearing a final decision on that at this moment. Okay. But that's a decision point. Absolutely. And it kind of goes along with the inclusion specialist. I put inclusion slash UDL, which is universal design delivery. But she has right. two different people or positions in mind, but it's acronyms. I know. And that's awesome. It's not universal design for living, it's learning. for learning. See, I don't even know my acronyms. Duh. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll move that down because Allison has made her view clear and she's not advocating for an adjustment, but we might, depending on circumstances. Um, so if we flip to the second page, I think um, everything else is sort of status quo there. And sorry, can you just forget any of the salary projections? Oh, right, right. Um, so there is a potential that we could adjust our budget of projections for um, the teachers and professionals group because as you know, that's an estimate based on the expiring contract, based on people moving on their steps on the expiring contract, and then a guesstimate of what a, a COLA might be agreed on, cost of living adjustment might be agreed on by the negotiations team. Um, so I haven't had a sense that we know enough about negotiations right now because there, I don't think there's even still a, a proposal on the table from the union yet. There is a proposal, um, but I don't know that it's includes salaries. So oh, you no, well, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I know they have language out there, but they haven't talked about a salary table. Yeah. Or, yeah, you've been subject to conversation with Amy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it would really be up to, to Amy and the negotiations team to talk about how comfortable they feel with the resources that have been provided to them to negotiate with. Right. And that's the whole basis of that conversation. Um, but there's, you know, there's a potential to say, well, you know, we, we don't think we have the right amount in our budget and we think we can do the job with the next dollars. Um, so yeah, that's still in there as a, in my yellow, yellow blob. Thank you. All right, so second page, we talked the last time about uh, the Plumbridge and Sound System and the fact that we got a reduced scope and new quote, and I think that's the same that you saw the last time. Mm -hmm. um, on the scoreboard, we had uh, lots of conversation about that. Um, I think that the way we left it was that we didn't really feel like we needed to do alumni gym right away, that we weren't really convinced that there would be significant savings. And in fact, we confirmed that with Todd this morning that um, he didn't feel that there would be enormous savings by doing the two at once, um, which was our, his and my original concept. Um, meanwhile, we don't have an actual quote yet, I don't think, Mike was getting so what I'd ask Mike to do is to go back to the vendor and get specific um, quotes. And I asked him to get kind of like a high, mid, low quote. So 
what is the you know the one that he's envisioning that will allow to generate revenue through advertising we can get that code you all can see it um, what's what's it going to cost to replace exactly what we have and are there more efficient options and so like one example the guy said was you could instead of a plumber gym replacing because there's actually two school boards in each gym remember so that's what one drives up the gym. cost a bit you could put one full school board and then you could have a tinier one that just shows up the score at the other end of the gym wait you're um, saying there's two score boards in each gym mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. right yeah. and um so we're really talking about two or four so we're talking about four school boards. right and so you know that I said well let's get the quote for that but that feels like taking a step backwards and I don't know that that would be what we would want to do but one of the other things that I've been trying to do is get my hands on some data to really understand how much plumber gym is used, um, how much it's not used. There's no really good clean data source for that. I can see that, um, like, actually I can pull it right up. For example, community services blocks that space through RevTrack, so it shows them as having like 326 reservations, but the, some of those reservations are us. <laughs> they, yeah. It just gets scheduled through that, or if it needs to be maintenance, um, if there's maintenance that needs to happen and the gym is closed, that looks like a reservation. Um, or if, because they have to put it, right. you know. Yeah, I, so they block so it people off, don't think it's available. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't really have like the cleanest way to really um, assess that. And then we don't have clean data either on, okay, who uses the sound system and who doesn't. Yeah. Because what might happen is, for example, Southern Maine Craftsman uses it for three days um, annually. And, um, they might, it doesn't say that they're using the sound system, but they might say to the custodian, like, hey, can we get a mic? We really need to make an announcement, and the custodian will go and get the mic and fix, set it up for them. So um, that happens, I think, more than not, is like people get there and they're like, yeah, and can we, you know, sure. do this? So um, last year, according to RevTrack, or RecTrack rather, there were 420 reservations for Plumber Gym. Um, and this is January 2018 to December 2018 because sometimes there will be you know something at four and then something at seven. I thought you said that when they use that gym though they're using if it's not a school program they're using their own equipment. So that is what some people think <laughs> but then upon actually asking what happens that that custodian example I just gave you is what happens often. Okay. So although they might not be using our scoreboard they might need to make an announcement and ask to use the sound system. Um, is the sound system it's completely unusable? Um, or just it's the old. current sound system? Yeah. It's just old. It's okay. there's something to do with like the I, I don't even want to use the wrong words. Okay. Um, but it's like our FCC conversation. Right. It's like we the know, FCC conversation. We know none of the correct words. It's the original sound system from like 1990 that was put in when the gym was put in. Same with the scoreboard. Um, so they're just aging and failing and what I did learn about the scoreboard because I wasn't saying the right thing Mike sent me a very detailed email about it um, Was that like you know how digital eights are like eight yeah. line mm -hmm. slant line slant line, right? So it's not just the light bulb replacing the light bulb if a, if a bulb goes you have to replace the whole strip They're on like strips together um, And that's what makes it so um, inefficient um, Which and costly. Costly. It's actually kind of hard to find it back in cars Right um, when you say the vendor quote from the vendor, we only use one vendor to get quotes. No, but in this situation, like he, this is somebody who he has a working relationship with, and it's someone who's accessible and local. And we were asking him, you know, to turn it around in like twenty four hours gotcha. for us because I wanted to have it for this conversation, um, but I didn't get it by four thirty. So we would typically get you know three or four quotes, or mm -hmm. even do a bid process depending on what it is. How it thing was. Yeah. But what, I, what wasn't making sense is that we were saying it's cost efficient to do them together, but yet if we're only going to do one gym, it's half the cost. Mm -hmm. So I was like, give us is more concrete more numbers, that. which is typically what happens between first and second reading. Um, we get refined quotes. and. Well, what's the that. process for, for him making the request to begin with? I mean, did he get a quote to come up with the estimate? Mm -hmm. And so he puts in a proposal just like Allison would put in a proposal for the inclusion specialist. Same sort of thing, justifies the cost, um, would include a quote or an estimate based on, and, um, and it, it looks a lot of different ways depending upon what they're asking for. Um, and then he really was only asking to do one gym. Um, and then Kate and Todd, when they met and go over the CIP budget and say, okay, what can we do, what can't we do? They put both of them in for the reasons that Kate explained last time. 
Um, and so now, I mean, the choice is really now, do you want to do nothing? Do you want to do one gym? Or do you want to do both gyms? So he was only asking for plumber. Yes. Yes. Okay. And just saying, eventually, we may need to do alumni. Okay. Um, and then it got turned into a cash deal. Because <laughs> gotcha. Because Kate and Todd said that nobody used them. <laughs> um, so, so I think that that number that we have in there we can change to an accurate number for the cost of plumber, and then we can decide, is that something we're gonna move forward with, or we're gonna defer? Okay. Yeah. So the 13, the... The 13,000 a little reduction is a, a sorry. Confuse over, but yeah. that, that was just, the, we got a new quote, so that's the reduction. There. The reduction of 13,000 for the sound system is accurate, okay. because okay. we have a new quote, and we well, reduced and he, the he scope of the project. The quote, right. So basically he said, you know, I, I can't do it for that. I can't have the top of the line um, quote from you. I want you to give me something that will be adequate, but not, okay. you know. Or I think it was, it included replacing the speaker or something. And he said, let's not replace the speaker right. and so, just do the technical pieces. So we're saying now, I mean, if we took it based on the new assessment, it would be $12,000 for a plumber gym sound system. Including installation. At forty thousand uh, and forty thousand dollars for a plumber gym scoreboard, right? Two scoreboard plus installation, and so and yeah, sorry, yeah, yes. and and nothing for alumni is right. where we're at. Right. That's okay. where, that's yeah, what that's said. that's okay. what this is sort of referring to, and the only thing that's a, a fluffy number is the reduction of forty thousand from the original eighty thousand because we're not sure that's entirely accurate. That we can just divide, but that we're that we have to two. cut it in half or. The that's other part correct. too is this isn't going to change your bottom line, your net budget has, because this is a project that was scheduled to be bonded. So, although that will help in debt um, service in your future. Alumni, the scoreboards were considered um, appropriated. It was the buses that were appropriated. Right? Right. Um, who has the town budget? Book? I have the, right here. Um, Athletics equipment, one hundred five thousand, is slated to be appropriated. So that actually would change the terms. What is the yeah. the scoreboard? It was yeah, the scoreboards and the sound system and the sound system together were lumped together under high school athletic equipment, and it was slated according to the town schedule to be appropriated. Okay. And the total ask was for both things was one hundred five thousand. 25 originally for the sound system and 80 for the, does that work? Yeah, yep. 80 for the um, scoreboards. So right now, the most it would be, if both the prep pl plumber gym was fully done, it would be 52,000, that would be the most. So right. it would be a $61,000 reduction. Right. 63, for 52. Unless Tom already included that in the adjustments that he made, I don't know when for what he was shifting from. I don't think there's been any, any votes taken on that, but if it was shifted from appropriated to bonded, yeah, I think um, I don't think that I they think had he only did the truck. Yeah, that's just the truck. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because I have that on our chart that the truck was going to be shifted from appropriated to finance. Yeah. They didn't. That's they didn't the discuss. Bonding the scoreboards okay. that I know of, and I don't know that I just it. watched the last uh, council finance committee meeting. I don't remember. Yeah. That Typically, they under a hundred thousand. They don't, but then they did with the vehicles. So, um, I think the last well, well, there's two things. One is about impact fees, and I'll let Julie talk about that in a sec. Um, the bus purchase amount. That's another exciting conversation I had today. Um, you probably remember that in our current CIP budget, there are three buses, and then there's a note that says that we're gonna receive grant funding for one of them, right? Um, so a couple of things. One is that I brought um, some fleet information, and we've had some conversations there, but as far as the money is concerned, Right off the bat, um, what's changed is that in the past we had to purchase the buses 
from the vendor, pay the vendor the full price, take the old bus off the road, because the whole point of this with DEP is that you're decommissioning a stinky bus and you're putting a nice new efficient bus on the road. Um, and then eventually down the road, you would get the funding from the DEP. Um, and so because we didn't know exactly when that, what that timetable would look like, I put it in as an expenditure, 100%, and I can put an offsetting revenue in. So that's what um, you know, a bunch of us have been talking about. Well, wow, the, the cool thing is that with this VW settlement, the, I think probably because the funding is guaranteed and in their pockets already, the um, DEP worked out a deal directly with the vendor. So we will receive a discounted price up front on that vehicle. And we do not have to budget for the full cost of the vehicle because we will only have to pay the portion of it that DEP isn't gonna pay. And then they're gonna pay the vendor for the vehicle. So we can, automatically so we can shrink that. our uh, request, our CIP request, by the uh, $75,000, which is what uh, more or less the amount that the DEP is going to come up with us mm -hmm. for us. We'll get the exact amount from O'Connor before we do second reading so we can know it to the penny. Um, but that's the ballpark of it. Um, I did make a note there that because the buses were originally slated to be bonded, that it wouldn't reduce the appropriations request, the tax request, but it will reduce our capital budget and then therefore adjust for this in the future. So, okay. it's That's still great. a cool thing. Um, on the topic of buses, do you Should we go, yeah. keep going with buses? All right, so um, this fancy thing is um, our, our fleet of vehicles. Yeah. Um, our fleet of vehicles, and I've sorted this um, based on the type of vehicle. So the first page you can see is all the buses, and they're sorted by their year, um, model year. And then the, on the back, if you flip it over, you've got the passenger vans, um, the lunch truck, and the facilities and maintenance vehicles. So this is everything that, that we own that is a vehicle on the road. So I took a couple of notes in here to help guide our thoughts. Um, the first bus, the oldest bus on there, is actually hasn't been replaced yet because it's one of the few that we have with a wheelchair lift, and it's not dead yet. So we've actually kept it limping along even though it's well past the age when we replaced other buses. Um, but until it dies, we're using it because it has a wheelchair lift. Well, I bet you said that the recommendation was mm. 10 years. It absolutely is, and this is only because we don't have a new a wheelchair bus to replace it. Um, we did get a new wheelchair bus this fall, and I think this one will be going away um, as long as we've got sufficient capacity for the kiddos. But it's kind of a, it's, it's an anomaly because normally we would take that, that vehicle off the road. Um, you'll see that there, and actually that vehicle was scheduled to be taken off the road and should have been gone, but because we still had the need for the wheelchair lift, we kept it alive. Okay. And the next three you see here, the, the yellow ones, are the three that are slated to be replaced because of their age. 2006 model year, 2007 model year. So they're over 10 years old. Um, but you can see that there's a, there's a jump there, and those 2006 and 2007s are the last of the older buses that we bought in a large quantity, um, which is why this is the last year that we are trying to do three buses to get back on target for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, there's two buses that I've highlighted that are um, special ed wheelchair small buses, the 22 passengers, mm -hmm. seeing the seating capacity. And then there are six buses that are propane buses Sorry, can you say wheelchair? Do they have a wheelchair lift? They the do, but they're, they only have the capacity for a small uh, number of kids. Okay. So you've got, you could have a big long bus that also has a wheelchair lift in the back that has capacity to carry a lot of kids, mm -hmm. or you can have a small bus that has less capacity um, but has wheelchair capacity. Um, typically nowadays, we will buy a long bus because it's just so much more flexible. And you can always take seats out of a long bus, and you know you can convert space for wheelchairs if you have the lift. 
but or you can put seats back if you don't need it. Um, the short buses aren't really that efficient. Right. You can never substitute a, a wheelchair bus that's only 20 feet capacity for a regular for bus, a bus to take a run. In it exactly. Right, that we would need that. Exactly. Um, the ones that are marked propane, you'll notice that um, the first four that came in in uh, 2011 and 2012, they have a 77 passenger capacity which is smaller than our 84 passenger buses, the big diesels. Um, and that is because O'Connor was only making buses with propane that had a smaller seating capacity. So we have actually run into a little bit of an issue with the um, two-tiered bus run and the longer runs and the fewer drivers where those propane buses uh, that we currently own are not the most efficient vehicles for us right now. We really need the extra seats um, so it's a little bit of a pinch for us, but we are still using them. And um, then there's two in 2015 that we bought from Thomas from Cressy because they had a slightly larger seating capacity and we still had the um, wish for the propane. Where you see those propane buses, the reason that we purchased them is, well, for one reason it is that they're clean energy and that's a great thing, but it was because we got DEP grants that we're paying um, for the, the first four, they paid about half the cost. And for the second, uh, the first four and the second two, <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, the next two, they paid 25% of the cost, which is still significant on a $100,000 vehicle. And those grants, yeah. Um, the DEP grant that's happening right now is, um, they don't have a grant cycle going right now for just their own funding. Um, because of the VW settlement, I think. Yeah. Because they're just saying, oh, we have this windfall of money, we're gonna distribute that, we're gonna use our grant um, mechanisms to get that money out to the communities. And then um, I wouldn't be surprised if the feds went back to providing funding uh, on a rotating basis. Um, there are some drawbacks to the propane buses. You can see in my summary down at the bottom, we've got 22 full-size diesels, we've got two short diesels and six propane buses, which have the smaller capacity. And the other issue with the propane buses is that re refueling stations for propane are not um, quite as widespread as your normal diesel gas station. Mm -hmm. And although there are places to refuel across the state, we tend to keep those buses local because we can refuel them at public works. So if they're cruising around town or they're going to Portland or you know even uh, a little bit wider range, we, we typically wouldn't send them to Bangor or you know, um, on a field trip to Boston or anything like that because the, of the uncertainty of the fueling. Mm -hmm. um, so what else was I gonna tell you about this? Um, one of the, the, the reason we kind of started the conversation was Alicia saying, you know, do we have too many vehicles? Could we downsize our fleet? And could we sell some buses and save some money or make some money? And um, so I, I know that Joanne had some emails going around about that. Um, and of course, Sarah's been out of town, but I think Joanne talked with her. I talked with Public Works about it when we were having this conversation um, about uh, the funding and the, and the grant. I brought it up at the same time, and, and um, Ed Alden, who's the head of the maintenance department and takes care of our buses, said that in his experience, typically there's one vehicle that needs some kind of service every day. And there's probably one other vehicle that is on schedule for some preventive maintenance every day. So if you have the complement of 22 drivers that we would hope to have, um, and you had bus runs for those folks to do, then you'd have an excess of two short buses and six propane buses above that number, right? So if two of them are kind of in a maintenance cycle, that leaves you four vehicles for sports trips and field trips that might be driven by a spare driver um, and wouldn't be would be happening at the same time as your regular bus runs. So the short answer is that there are days when all the buses are gone. Mm -hmm. There are days when all the buses are not gone. But I think it does bear 
some more conversation when we have Sarah back in town and we can bring Ed to the table to talk about the maintenance cycle and things like that. Um, I think that my understanding is that we don't think that the fleet is too big. We think it's sufficient for our needs. Um, but it's certainly something that we can gather some more information about. What, what, what's the bus number again when it's fully staffed? It's 22 drivers if we if we have everybody we need, plus spare drivers. That would be 22. So we don't have 22 full-time drivers in the budget. Um, we only have 18 full-time drivers in the budget. Mm. We've budgeted right. for the unfilled positions, though. Oh, well, does it right. say that's that who's hired. Does it say that we currently have? Oh, that's what I'm asking. We, so yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. We have 22 in the budget. Yes, we have we have optimistically budgeted <laughs> over the past two years for a full complement of drivers. Of should we be able to hire them? So, just and the lack of bus drivers is a local trend, right? It's a national trend. Yeah. yeah. Is it? Are there any indication that that's changing in the next year? Um, no, it's kind of economy driven in some regards, um, but also CDL licenses are really highly, highly in high demand, I should say. Um, so, I mean, you drive by pretty much anywhere and you see CDL drivers needed um, signs right out in front of businesses and things like that. So, so we're going to keep that we have a negotiated bus contract, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. um, in terms of attracting drivers. But yeah, so we have we have nineteen plus three open positions is twenty two. Mm -hmm. So we, we have three budget we have twenty two budgeted and yes. yes. So the budget numbers that you look look at there for salaries and benefits would include three open positions, which if it's an open position and we don't have someone in it currently for in like this kind of a circumstance, I would typically budget at the base salary for a new driver and then an average of um, health benefits. And everything else is kind of proportional benefit lines. So this is 22 drivers. Yes, the value that you see in the budget right now is for 22. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I should probably think about that when we're writing the narrative too, because we're saying we have 19 drivers because we do. But right, well that was yeah, good I got point. hammered at a budget outreach over it, <laughs> and I don't I know. And to look at the line item, I don't. You know don't know what's included right. in there. Right. But the narrative says that we have 19 drivers and 28 buses. Yeah. So. Yeah. We could send him a, pro a spreadsheet of bus drivers too. Bus well, he was here last week when I asked the question, and I asked the question because he asked me mm -hmm. about it and mm -hmm. for the point. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, the other. Do you have anything else on the buses? I think that's down? everything on the buses. And the only other thing that I brought, which we never really kind of, did we spend time talking about athletic stuff besides the CIP? Was there anything left um, out there? Well, there's a bunch of questions. And um, oh, right. Yeah. I didn't get to talk to Leanne today, but Mike has, I, I asked him all the questions that you guys had last time specifically about um, game coverage formula, like that was mm -hmm. my words, not mm -hmm. his. Um, and so he said there is no formula, but we pay $50 per game for coverage. Um, there never has been a formula that he's aware of, but we've been paying that $50 amount since he, since before he was hired. So that's been sort of the amount for game coverage, um, and we haven't increased it for many years. So it, whether we have five people sitting at the table taking tickets or two, those people are sharing fifty dollars, or each ticket person. taking is different than game coverage. Game okay. coverage is someone who's there for the whole entire game. Okay. Um, you know, football games are one where we do have a lot of game coverage because these kids are all over. And so you're talking about like the supervision, right? right? Actually covering the game. Um, I didn't ask specifically about what the ticket takers make. Do you know that, Kate, off the top of your head? Oh, I should, but I don't. All right, I can ask. So are teachers getting paid fifty dollars a football game if they come in? Supervisor, or is that part of their contract? Mm -hmm. 
teachers don't supervise oh. things that I'm aware of. You often see teachers there, um, like Dan, for example, Curly goes to everything. He's not getting paid to do that. He does that because he wants to connect with his kids. And I thought you said something about teachers. Not just who's getting paid. Like they have a do so in the teacher contract. They have a, a duty that they need to fulfill yeah. in order to meet the terms of the contract. Like a lunch duty or and one of the options that they can do yeah. is, is to, to go to an after school event. Yeah. But they don't get paid extra for that. No, no. It's, no. it's contractual. Like who's day. getting the $50. And the supervision people are usually, Depends. some of our, they're usually hourly people, so. Um, they're usually connected to the school. Well, they're always connected to the school in some way. Like okay. um, Kelly Johnson might do, so like Saturday, Sunday, I went to the Portland Youth, um, dance recital they have here and we have um, in our policies we have to have a um, site supervisor we put that in place so Dan who's an employee of Todd's department was there as the site supervisor so he would get paid for supervising that event even though that's not even a school related event but because they're in our schools we want to make sure that they mean anything or anything happens um, but I did ask how are how do you determine um, how many staff are needed and how they're compensated. So he said it's determined by him and Jordan and it depends on the event. For example, at most games they, tip they typically have a clock operator, an announcer, a bookkeeper, media gate, player gate, crowd control staff, could be multiple people. From time to time, um, we have other positions as well. During basketball, we use the person to do the music for the games as, a boost as boosters wanted to try to increase spectator crowds. Um, Joe Davis and Tom Spencer are the athletic trainers, so as we talked about, that's part of their contractual obligation, um, but they also have student interns sometimes, so that could, you could see a lot of people and think that, like last night at the field hockey game, there were six student interns that were there with Joe. Um, I should have brought the I'm trying to see. <laughs> So if somebody's salary, they're not getting paid the fifty dollars, right? Yeah. That's just part of it, right? That's most people like Sue goes to every single game yeah. because she wants to connect her kids and be have mm -hmm. be visible and have a presence. I try to go to a lot of games for that same reason, but no, they're not getting any additional pay. And then, is an hourly employee getting paid pursuant to their hourly arrangement, or are they getting the fifty dollars? They get the fifty dollars per game per person. And sometimes it'll be a coach, like you might see Lance Johnson um, supervise a, something other than football, or another coach supervise something other than their sport. Okay. Um, who's able to provide coverage? Again, he said we use a wide range of people. I try to use the off-season coaches and in-house staff. We also contract with the police department from time to time. Um, you probably see that at the football games. Team physician donates his time to the medical partner. And then I said, is it required to have a certain amount of people? And he said, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Um, he feels it's a requirement to have event coverage, but if there's no like official rule. Um, so it's more of a philosophical, and that's why I think our events are run well, um, and our parents feel safe. I mean, football season gives us all a big worry because a lot of kids are just dropped off. You know, we send letters and we say, don't do that. Um, but I think it, there's a lot of false sense of security because they're inside that fenced in area. It's and kind of Lord of the Flies with you. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty wild when you get down no, here. I've been, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me very <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, so, uh, do, 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 do. and so he just said, he's not aware of any Class A school that does not have game support. Um, it's pretty standard practice. It's, he said that one school that he knows of, Thornton Academy, actually contracts all their security people with a security company for every event. Um, and he has a person, a retired police officer, that is paid to be head of security um, at events. And so one of the things that has come up through our health safety security advisory team is that during the day we have lots of coverage, we have lots of support right up early, buildings are locked down. And then like three o'clock hits, or yep. two fifteen hits, and 
everything's open. We have it's a free for all. It's a free for all. Mm -hmm. And so that feels um, mm -hmm. we feel like that gave us really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So do those um, that coverage is under line item contract services? Yes. The supervision should be under contract services. Okay. Um, there's a coaching line and sometimes there's an overlap there. Coaching stipends, but mm -hmm. when you're talking about the, you know, the helper worker needs, that's the contract of service. Line. But yep. the majority of that line is, is athletic um, uh, officials, because those are combined. Yes, athletic officials and yeah. also ice time and pool time are in there. Okay. So, so this is that 125 2 number? Over your shoulder. Yes. Yes. Athletic officials and services. Mm -hmm. Yes. I and I, too, I, at one point, I had labeled that with ice time and pool time in that line, and I don't know quite how I lost that. These um, accounts come out of the MUNA system with really generic names, and so I just rename that sometimes to make it more clear what's actually in yeah. there. I think I lost one of my clarifiers. I did bring with me these things, which are kind of fun. Um, one of the questions we had was like, where where does our spending on athletics compare? How does it compare with yeah. other districts? Oh, that's good. So if you want to pass that around, I just went back to our old per pupil expenditures chart, which I think you guys have seen um, in other contexts. It's another one of my favorites. <laughs> Julie's favorite. So this starts in 2910 and works its way up to 2018, FY18, which was the last year that we have data, and this data is pulled from the Department of Education. So they're the ones um, accumulating the data and putting them out for all to see. And because co-curricular and extracurricular, meaning athletics and activities, are their own budget category, um, it's one of the voter categories in the referendum, which means that we have to segregate it for the Department of Education, and we have to keep it as its own little department. And so what that means is that we can gather data for just that type of expense from the other schools as well. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the third white column that says other instruction, that's the generic label that goes over top of that budget category in, like, in the budget book. That's co-curriculars and extracurriculars. Exactly. What is other instruction? Other, other instruction, instruction in, in this exactly. context is co-curriculars and extracurriculars. And so what I did was I pulled out the that column and I sorted by that column from the highest per pupil expenditure to the lowest. And then for each year did that same thing just to see where we stand in comparison with this peer group that we've been collecting data on. And so you, you're actually going to see an interesting trajectory because Scarborough is like under the state average, towards the bottom, or at the bottom for the first several years. And then um, it isn't until 2016 um, 17 that we actually slip above the state average and start to climb a little bit. And so 16 17 and 17 18, you see us moving up the chart in comparison with the other districts. And that speaks to. Um, Mike has just recently said in some email that I was reading that we've been making a concerted effort to try to increase the operating budget for athletics so that we are not so dependent on booster funding. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the fact that in 2010-11, um, we're at the bottom of the pile here in spending of all these districts and well below the state average, and yet we're funding um, probably more teams than a lot of these other districts, more varsity level teams, mm -hmm. um, more multi-level teams, and with what I guess you could call a higher success rate because we're consistently in the postseason. And if you look at 2009 to 2010, we were spending, the state average was 344, and now the state average is 311. So just like to notice how that has fluctuated too mm -hmm. for people. Oh yeah, just um, right. So right. it's like, you know, 
just comparing apples to apples, but also that um, our spending doesn't go up every year. So you can see from 09, from FY10 to FY11, it decreases by almost $81 per student. Right. Can um, I take an extra one of those for Amy? Because I know oh, she had a ton yeah. of questions. Well, but, yeah, the thing is to grab what you like. Use a couple. So this um, includes, so it says athletics and, and other. So would any of these potentially be overly, like I guess, would you imagine this then to shift if you take out the co-curriculars? Co-curriculars, which is just clubs. Yeah, and just right. have athletics. Do you think it would be roughly the same, or are any of these towns specifically high? I don't have that data because it's con it's all it's all combined yeah. when when we're looking at the the DOE numbers. Um, you know, typically athletics costs more than clubs. Yeah. And so I my guess would be that the proportion between co-curricular and athletics in these districts is probably fairly similar to ours, um, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, you know, if they had some really super expensive, exciting club that they were funding, and it, it could be. I mean, we have Oak Hill players, mm -hmm. and their productions can cost a lot of money, but because they make a lot of money in mm -hmm. ticket sales, yeah, they're not true. relying on our budget to support that. So, if, for example, Yarmouth might be, you know, their theater club might be fully supported in the budget, and they get to take the ticket sales and go out to supper or something. Mm -hmm. um, this is really crazy. Um, but it is hard because it's you're not you're not always comparing apples to apples. Yeah, you know. But I think it's better than it was because the the state has, Department of Education has done a lot of outreach to business managers to talk about what goes in what account and how is it that you report your expenditures so that we are all speaking the same language and we are all putting things in the same place. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on a list serve with the business managers all over the state, and you know. Every ten minutes, there's a. Well, you, well, what do you do about this? Well, I have one such and such over here. No, no, no. It's supposed to be over there. Well, and although this is sorted by other instruction, you can t just look at the other columns. So, to the question of is our fleet the right size? Well, look at what we're spending for transportation and facilities combined compared to the other school systems. We're yeah. one. Our transportation I think we're the lowest well. actually on that list out of all these school systems. Um, the other question about special education, do people just come here because we have like cream of the crop services, right? We have amazing staff and we have really great services, but look at our spending comparatively. Um, if you would like, I can share this with you as an Excel document. Oh wait, Kate, my favorite column, system admin. Just take a look at that one for FY18. So this idea that we have <laughs> heavy you just like system administration. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> else is this floor. Yeah. <laughs> the lowest yeah. by far. But this it's, is this is the narrative that we've tried to share in a variety of ways and it just never seems to stick is that you yeah. get a good value, you get a great return on your investment mm -hmm. here in Scarborough when it comes to your public education. I mean, overall per pupil cost, we're fifth from the bottom, I think. So there's only Four districts spending less than us. One's the state. We're average. actually right in the middle. No, well, that's not sorted by. You got to actually count them up dollar value wise because it's only sorted, sorted by, by the other instruction column. Um, that's why I want to share it with you as an Excel so you can play around with it if you yes. want to. Yes, it can be a good thing. You think that I can use Excel? Sure. You just click on the little arrow. I know, in theory. And then mommy's like, okay. I can <laughs> sort it for you any day. I think the Thank the you for pointing that out because it's like, oh, we're in the middle. Uh, yeah. The other thing that we did in that same in that same worksheet is to try and do a little analysis year by year. That. You can't read that one. Stand by. It's year by year with um, types of expenditures. So we pulled out direct student instruction and we went year over year. Right. And then we did student staff support year over year, and then you know, so taking the sort of categories of spending and doing a year over year. Um, I like that. Yeah, I think we like we can also share that with the full board. Is that's helpful just for everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the communications. I think so it should go on the other budget materials too. I have a version of it that's this, which I sorted by. Athletics because that's what we wanted to talk about, but I could just put the actual spreadsheet and say, hey, look at all this stuff, but I feel like I might not be providing enough context that way. Um, and I think we 
just throw it in the drive, and then we can talk about them and let them know that it's there. Okay. I'll what do you think about it putting it on the budget portal? I think the more information, yeah, the better. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think it needs a lot of content. Yeah, yeah, yeah I really don't. Yeah, don't. I think, it's but not this one sorted by athletics. No, I'm going to go right. back to the original yeah, right. one. And, and I like the one by out. voter category with the years across, because then we can see trending trends. That's a tab on the same spreadsheet. Okay. Um, and I think that they're sorted. This one is sorted by 2017, 18 figures. The ones by expense type, and then this one is by total cost figures, total per pupil cost, and then it's by year, so let me get this up into the drive. I mean, I would think sorting it by total per pupil cost. Okay, so, so, okay, so guys, I have this book on Trail 630. Okay. Okay. It's 623. I'm going to go right up to the public hearing, but I just want to be respectful of everyone else's time. You guys all plan to stay. Do we need food? No, we're not good. I'm staying forever. <laughs> we can have Hillary oh, stop uh, the, the Hannaford yeah. oh, rice man. It's either yes. lollipops or rice. Yeah. <laughs> lollipops or rice. Oh, that's wow. what she had in her container. That's she's yeah. going to start eating. Yeah. Like, low medium. I think, I think, Julie, the only other thing, at least from my notes, that we had a question on was just the impact fees. From my research, it cannot, it has to be using capital improvement. Not operational, but I just don't yes, know how much reason that is that. true. Um, that that is absolutely true. It has to be CIP. It has to be bricks and mortar. It can't just be like you know we're going to buy tech equipment and so we're going to use it. Um, so I didn't read bricks and mortar. I just said capital improvement projects. But does that imply bricks and mortar? My the part that we actually put in our slide deck I think says specifically like structure, doesn't it? Well, what about the boiler was one of the... Mm, yeah, so see, what I, I emailed about Tom that. Hall about it um, yesterday, this Tuesday. I haven't gotten a reply back yet from him. Um, so I can I'm have it up right now. It says exclusively for capital improvements. Mm -hmm. It shall not be used for operational, but it does not say... Bricks and mortar. Bricks and mortar. Okay, is that the part that references the 2001... I mean, this entire thing is out of date. And it also says the school impact fees yet can only be used through 2012. For the things that were in the strategic plan. Right. So we're already by. <laughs> no, no, we're not, because this was in there then. <laughs> okay. It's not a new story. Um, I actually reviewed the plan. Okay. So it was it was to eliminate modulars, actually, is what it was <laughs> trying right. to do, both in 2001 and 2018. Um, but I thought that paragraph, do you have the whole thing? Mm -hmm. But either way, we can get clarification on that. Um, so I did ask how much of the fees, how, is there any excess school impact fees in the fund? Was any of it uh, additional fees applied to debt service this year? Mm -hmm. um, if not, is that money still available for capital yeah, we're still waiting for this one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. So and I think that'll be a great conversation piece along with the debt service. Um, increases per Monday. Okay. What's the difference between last time and this time for the CIP? Um, the buses are different and let's see, I added a little section down at the bottom about revenue because um, I wanted to, I, you know, last time I had highlighted that school capital non tax revenues because it was the um, adjustment between what was bonded and what wasn't. Well, uh, what was appropriated? I think I misspoke. The, uh, so last time we had total CIP adjustments, 98000 and now we have total CIP expenditure adjustments, 128000 Right, because I separated out the revenue. Because we had the reduction of um, $45,000 okay. as, uh, as part of the top. Okay. total and then I felt like that was a little confusing because we've got one section where we're changing the budget our expenditures and then another section where the revenue is impacted okay and then down at the bottom I also added a little box on tonight's version that sort of summarizes that again that says you know here's what we're doing to our expenditure budget and then we've got this revenue thing so here's the net uh, the change to the net budget which is the tax request on the school side Make sense? No, how come the revenue adjustment is not in parens down below, but it is up top? That's a silly question. Um, I see 
because well yeah it's sorry it's a, it's a what we should do is we should change it so that this one it's minus forty five thousand appropriated for the trucks right yeah and what I've got is I've got plus forty five thousand right. bonded so minus forty five thousand dollars appropriated plus so it's just so the, the forty five the forty five should be in parentheses. And the, 75 and the 75 should not, should and then not. the 30 becomes a, a positive, positive amount. Yeah. Okay. So the bottom 30 should not. The bottom is right. The bottom is right. Okay. Or it will be when I put another. This is how I can tell I'm tired <laughs> when my brain starts slowing down. So, Kate, okay, if we yeah. reduced the overall education budget, operating budget, right, by 118? Yes. 569? And we increased CIP revenue by 30. We actually decreased CIP revenue by 30 because we took out $75,000 for buses that we don't need. We added the, and this is where the minus signs are weird. CIP revenue. Because CIP revenue is non tax revenue used for CIP. So it's bonding, Bond, financing, yeah. right? So we have. Uh, actually, I think it needs to be the other way around. Yeah, I think yes. you yeah. added 45 to non-tax revenue bonded, right. I mean, less the 75, so it is right. So actually, in, in, in CIP non-tax revenue, we oh, increased one. our bonding by 45,000, but then we decreased our bonding by 75,000. So that means a net decrease in school capital non-tax revenues, which is that. Yellow thing at the bottom. Right, so that means we should have it at the bottom. It should be in parens. Because you, do you like with this? Is this a reduction or an addition? <laughs> we're getting the we're getting forty five. So we're we're losing a forty five thousand dollars spending cost for the for the truck. It's it's apples and oranges though here. There's, no, that's part of the whole. There's apples and oranges here, Julie. I think the problem is that what what we're doing at the bottom is we're saying, what is what impact are we going to have on the tax request? Okay, so if we're making a reduction to our operating budget, but we're also decreasing our non-tax revenues, then the decrease to the tax request is that lower amount. The impact on the net budget, if you look at the difference between education net budget at the top of the page, top of page one, and the education net budget, which are, is our tax ask, at the bottom of page two, it's a reduction in our tax ask, our tax request of 88569 Yeah. And it would have been a reduction of 118000 had we not made those adjustments in CIP revenue. Yeah, so I just think it... It's parents. Um, the way you had it at the top and the below and then parents at the bottom gets us to that. My thinking's clear. Okay. So Kate, the difference between what's on this page mm -hmm. and this bottom mm -hmm. is you're saying this is it's the same thing. It's has. just less whatever everything that we had here, right? Or is this just the tax ask and this is not, and this is the complete budget? So the education gross budget is reduced by everything that we've changed in the budget, which is the expenditure change, which is 118,569. That is in the middle of page two. So if you go from education gross budget total budget expenditures so of 56,000 56, okay. and then you take out 118 569 you get 56018 on page 2 gotcha. for your education gross budget but because we've also made an adjustment to the school capital non-tax revenues we're financing less money which means that we don't get to reap the reward of the whole 118,569 and reduce our tax ask by that. Okay. 
Wait, can you repeat that last part again? Okay. Um, so we're reducing our operating budget, right. the over, well, I should say operating, our total education budget at 118,569. Right. Right. But we're also reducing the non-tax revenue for the buses because we don't need that $75,000. Right. We're throwing the truck into CIP, into bonding, and we're taking out the buses, which is a net increase. Sorry. Net decrease. I almost had it. <laughs> a net decrease in the non-tax revenues. Those, those are both net decreases, right? Um, yes, it's a decrease to the spending, but because it's a decrease to non-tax revenues, then it, in, it, it isn't as big an increase to your, it isn't as big a decrease to your tax rights. Which part? The, the bottom the line, track? the education net budget is smaller than the original, but not by the full amount of the reductions in operating. Because we had scheduled before to bond seventy five thousand, mm -hmm. but now we're only going to bond forty five thousand, mm -hmm. right? So now that means that in the revenue part, because you know how you have gross then revenue, gross mm -hmm. plus revenue mm -hmm. equals net, mm -hmm. right? Um, but now we're, we've reduced that that revenue piece because right. we're not going to bond that thirty thousand dollars. So that's why the net. Is lower. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank so you. Had, yeah. Thank I you. like that. Cracking it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we needed the puppet hands. <laughs> that's, that's the way we need it. Yeah. So uh, that's really confusing and complex to yeah. think about. Yeah. But so where are we at now for our overall change from so first the, reading? The overall change, just based on what's here between first reading and second reading, is a reduction in the net budget, meaning. The money we're asking for in taxes of $88,569. Not quite $1.3 Not quite $1.3 million. Um, but then again, I don't think we were really looking for $1.3 million in our spring. No, I heard that clear. <laughs> um, and with a few items still in motion, see right. the bottom part here. These are some of the kind of low hanging board decision points of course the oh, other the page one on the, on the bottom part and that's um, my little arrow is the clerical the compliance clerk if you do decide to reduce that um, and s these are like I would say like the low hanging fruit decision points you still have to make um, and then there's of course the whole you know, investments and, I, and I still so want to talk about that. so the only um, increases since first reading would be the main care, mm -hmm. um, um, the strategic planning, which we'll may talk about. May or may not need yeah. that. Yeah. And that's it. Um, well, we have six hundred and twenty-six oh, dollars for unified basketball, and we have um, forty-one two seventy suit two for debt service, debt service, which is expected to go down. Okay. Um, okay. So way down. <laughs> well. Yeah. <laughs> 70000 would be nice because that's what I budgeted. I don't know why it would be so dramatically different. It's not like we've had massive capital projects. It all depends on the bond market, you know, what your interest rates are going to be like. Darn. So is ICR ruling going into Monday um, is to basically share an updated version of this because, and also with it, because it's a full board decision and we're the only ones that we would have had this depth of knowledge at this point. So we're not only communicating to town council, but we're also communicating to, to our board. Yeah. And then go come with recommendations to our full board so we can say, if there's any other adjustments we want to make to this. Right. And then give them the opportunity to say, no, I don't like that. Maybe we should have an inclusion specialist. No, and then, right. and then we re rework it from there. So my, my ask is for the inclusion specialist to be included in the budget. I mean, how how do we handle that as a finance committee in terms of presenting that? Do we have to be in agreement in the finance committee? You are making a recommendation we'll ultimately a recommendation. to the full board on the 16th. So no actions, it wouldn't actually, I don't think be appropriate for you to be taking like micro actions mm -hmm. leading up to that. You've been tasked with providing 
the board with a recommendation. The tricky part is that, um, and then tomorrow, I think you, do you have committee updates tomorrow? We do. So you can talk about like some of these items that are in motion. We can talk about you know, how you're feeling about that position. Um, then you have the whole workshop together on Monday. No decisions are being made there either. Once we know what our bottom line, what the finance committee is going to recommend to council, we still won't know if that's really, if full council is going to support that. But then we'll have much more direction to come back and say like, okay, you know, what's yeah. in, what's out. And that's really Wednesday now is what the when eight. the finance committee is going to say, this is what we're going to recommend. Right. right. But then that they then have to recommend that. To the council. To the council. council doesn't have to that's agree with right. 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 So, Kate, so Kate and I right. probably need to clear our day on the 16th to react yeah. to whatever might happen at council because we won't know that. Already cleared. Until. And the 17th, I'm leaving town just for the night. Yeah, you want to come? It's graduation. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we, it makes now, sense. Just, just, just to be clear that we make decisions at the workshop, but I do think like it's our responsibility to go in with a recommendation yeah. so that the board can then take that away and then on the 16th and be pondering it. Yeah, yeah come back and say did we agree? Mm -hmm. yeah. So Tom handed out a worksheet, and I thought I had a copy of it, and I couldn't find it before I came at their town council meeting or their workshop saying that he was able to reduce the town side of the CIP by $744,000 was mm -hmm. like their, their ultimate, what he felt comfortable making his recommendation to the council. That in, wasn't reductions necessarily. No, it was, it was real, shifting. yeah, it was yeah. shifting to bonding, it was, it was doing all kinds of, the and task acts was shifted. Okay. And that's only based on C CIP reallocation? That and a couple based of on other some CIP reductions, so like the 171.5, that was for the revolving renovation account, mm -hmm. I think, is, um, that was a totally uh, deferred. So some things were deferred. They, they were going to set up an account to start putting money away for yeah. I mean, I watched the meeting, fire trucks and things like that, and they, they reduced, you know, he said one of the things that the council could do is decide to reduce the amount that was going into that account. And but that $700,000 figure is all CIP, is my question. Right. So he hasn't made any recommendations for reallocation and operating budget. Yeah. Not that I'm looking at. Okay. That would be what my vote's right. for. Mm -hmm. So I'm just nervous that we were coming in at 88 and Tom's coming in at 700. Well, to be fair, well, and no, that is ours. Well, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> it is our truck. <laughs> it is our truck. So, so it's not. I'm not saying like to, like comparing what he's coming in at what with what we're coming in at. I guess the bottom line is we're still not even close to 1.3. Well, it's not the 15th either. Uh, yeah. I mean, what are we going to do? Well, the question is, are we saying, yeah, we're going to hit 1.3, or are we saying, y'all task us with explaining to you why it's more than that, and here you go. I think it's both. It's a combination, Yeah, right? I think it's a combination. I don't want to come across as though we are um, being... Blowing anybody off. Yeah, as, as though we're being you know, rigid or, or uncompromising because $1.3 million to get us down to a 3% mill rate was what the town council set the goal and we did tentatively agree to that and then with the caveat that we mm -hmm. could be more. I think the pulse of the town council is that they are looking for it to be slightly more than 3%. But I think they want to see collaboration and cooperation from the board like I think it's important that we are their partners and mm -hmm. this is like a delicate yeah. well I mean we did have what how, how, what for increases yeah that's sixty thousand dollars right seventy well there's a hundred thousand dollars of unexpected increases right yeah. I mean well, yeah, yeah. Um, and so it, we just I would just say from a process standpoint like and Kate obviously has been doing this a lot longer than me it's not like you all just said, yep, we accept it. I mean, you've asked really tough questions. You put our feet to the no. fire and made us really go back and refine and rethink. And 
you know, are we really, do we really understand this proposal? Are we being good fiscal agents? So, I mean, just for you all, I mean, especially well, your first year with the budget. I think maybe we need to ask them to watch our, our finance committee meetings so that they can understand that. They're all publicly available. They're all publicly what, as, a, as the chair, would you be willing to email them and yeah. make I that mean, request? Yeah. Because, I mean, in order for them to understand that, they would really need to, to see that the work that's been done. And, and I worry that they're just going to be given an overview and not fully understand that. And, and nor should they if they don't mm -hmm. have that background. But I think that that's important. Yeah, that, that was why I really wanted to share all of the links in one spot for the work that led up to first reading, because I know it's hard sometimes to like pull it all together. Yeah. And so really just the last two finance committee meetings have been recorded, right? Can we work on a, yes. um, an email, a joint email that would explain some of the unexpected costs? I think that's pretty part of the presentation on mm -hmm. Monday. But, but yeah, but I but I um, wonder if maybe it would be in processed better yeah. in advance, and along with that, ask for them, you know, provide them with the um, information that our um, meetings have been taped, and yeah. that it would be helpful for, to them for background to have that information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think. Um, just thinking out loud here, guys. These aren't fully formed thoughts. But if we look at the increase since last week, which is about which is over a hundred thousand dollars, I guess I'm just one that you know would be t almost close to two hundred thousand dollars, which right. combined with their seven hundred thousand dollars is know, almost a million, a which time. really isn't that bad. And right. so I'm wondering if we should be prepared t to go through the budget and see if there's anywhere where we can make up that. Well, and that in a place it doesn't impact the classrooms, Julie. Right. Numbers, I right? would focus definitely on the sixty because I think the forty one is probably going to change, right. and maybe we can we'll know more about that. And if that service, forty one that service, but the sixty, yeah. This is easy for me to say um, without Allison's like here to defend her proposal, <laughs> but the um, compliance clerk, if you went to point six. That's eighteen. That's eighteen thousand, yeah. right there. So then it's still that getting it started, and getting. I, I don't know. I I I go towards the the sound system and scoreboards. Yeah, where, yeah. where I go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Of course, it shows too. That's fifty. I mean, if we use not impacting the classrooms as our guiding principle, yeah. so it'll start right that. near the top. But I really want to discuss the, the inclusion specials. I really feel strongly for that and want to advocate for them. Um, and so those reductions wouldn't even cover adding any right. inclusion right. specials. And I'm just looking at Alicia's trying to be, um, if you did those two things, realistic. I think if we're going to talk about the inclusion specialists, we have to go back to this list of investments because I don't think we're going to find an inclusion specialist in the operating budget by making reductions of, you know, five and ten thousand dollars here and there. So I think then we're looking at our new investments and looking at our priorities. Our priorities here. I think you right. could find it in that iPad. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I too. Yeah. I just worry that. You but again. Well, so I guess, so well, to make my point a little more clear, yeah. Yeah. this still has a red line somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so depending on what the ultimate bottom line that the town council decides on, some of this stuff, I, I just have a feeling, is going to be below the red line in terms of you know, our net budget. And so... If the HR specialist, you know, falls below the red line, or the STEM teacher falls below the red line, you know, I'm going to advocate for the STEM teacher over the inclusion. Well, me too. Specialist. But, but I think that um, 
you know, as much as I've disagreed with sort of how this has gone, I also think that the town council includes individuals who may really understand the value of some of those requests. I mean, I, I think that there are many people on that council that will agree that um, a STEM teacher is necessary, uh, mm -hmm. HR specialist is necessary, and I think that they will see the value in an inclusion specialist. And so, you know, I don't want to limit our options on I, that. I agree, and I don't want to, I don't. And, and I don't want to under, undersell them yeah. either yeah. in their ability to recognize the, the value, value of those yeah. things. And so, you know, I'm not, that's why I think a, an email in advance might be, yeah. it might be helpful to explain sort of some of these, these things yeah. of where we're coming out and why. Well, it, and I, I think it's a good point to our board too. Yeah. Because in a three minute update tomorrow night, I'm not going to be able to tell right. the full story. No. And I'm the last one to go down. We're ready. Yeah. <laughs> Are you done yet? Yeah. Okay. So just to kind of put some numbers to some of this, the adulting course that we wanted to run during Section Up, 66 students have already signed up. Wow. Um, the intro to engineering, 111. The intro to business, 122. The intro to computer science and coding. 92. So how many of those, the intro to business, what does that fall under? All of these would go under STEM. that STEM position um, because it gets teachers who are teaching those other courses, makes them more available to teach these. Um, so it's, and music productions, which is a course we ran through um, the program of studies just to see if there would be interest to run it, is there's 21 kids already signed up for it. Um, so, but we're looking to fund the startup costs of that through a SEC grant and or some other creative funding sources because it has $6,400 just for the, the materials. So that's something that's not in the budget, but might be a good talking point or something for people to come out and vote for. Um, I have a totally like, out in left field question, which is something that I was thinking about when we were listening to the food service presentation the other night. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm piecing together like six different meetings, so if I'm like completely <laughs> wrong, if you can just say no, like no. Um, we, we have an account that we are able to transfer money to our nutrition program to offset the cost. <laughs> that we use to offset the cost. And we transfer money into that account, and it showed up on the audit at the end of the, at year, the, end of the year. It's fund balance. So we use. have. Yeah. So do we? All right, now I'm gonna ask a really. Do we, can we question. use it up front? No, nope, that was my question. Do we you do we have a budgeted amount that we put into fund balance mm -hmm. every year? No, not into fund balance. Fund balance is. Um, technically what's left over when okay. you when you finished your year okay so right like we budgeted 20 for strategic planning but you only needed 10 okay right so fund balance is made up of all the incremental savings that you might have in 600 different GL accounts and it's just a rolling total okay it's when we do our budgeting do we take into account what's in the fund balance account to cover certain accounts that we know are going to have um, what we do, what we do with fund balance is, um, when we build a budget, we use a portion of what's left from the prior year, the audited year-end fund balance, as revenue in the next year. Okay. And we kind of have to do that. That's that statute that says you can't hold on right. to more than three percent of your budget. So if you look at the at your budget book and you look at the um, revenues page, you'll see that included in our non-tax revenues is. Three hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars of fund balance, which is what was left in the bank at the end of FY18. Okay. And last year we went to a lot of extra effort to try and build that up higher so that we could use five hundred thousand dollars as revenue in FY19. Because um, we knew we had a two point one million because we were filling our gap. So it's possible if you have a you know, curtailment or a strategic plan to make your fund balance a little bit higher in a given year. Okay. Um, and then, but then you would turn around and apply it as revenue. Okay. 
So do we, so okay, so that does kind of go back to do we use it in advance, which the answer is no. Can we use it before we know we have it? Um, if I said to you, uh, let's make our non-tax revenues, let's increase that fund balance amount from 350000 to 450000 well, chances are we will generate $100,000 worth of fund balance in this current year because we typically do, but it's not a guarantee. It's not in the bank yet. It's kind of like when they were talking about the impact fees and they said, well, we use what we have from two years ago because we've closed the books, we've audited it, we know we have the money, and then we use it in the next year. So there's like a two-year gap. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is what we have at the end of FY18, I'm using all of that in FY20. Right. I could say, yeah, by the end of FY19, that'll be a little bit bigger number, but I don't know that for a fact yet. I don't know how much. I mean, history will tell me that, yes, I will have more than that. Do we, do we anticipate having more because of withdrawing from the nutrition program? No, because we haven't done it yet. No, no, no. Right. So, so just speaking... <coughs> More that would be likely. that would be fund balance generated in next year's budget, right? Yeah. So, or it would be the fund balance generated in next year's budget that we didn't need to use for um, special effects, right? If food sales really go up, mm -hmm. if we want to do like a big school lunch marketing program, breakfast lunch, um, why eat anywhere else kind of program, and we don't have to um, supplement that program, like right in this budget, there's a hundred and eighty thousand dollars in the operating in the nutrition budget, then For we... FY20, I put 200000 Right. Yeah. So then, then in FY21... In FY21. Okay. So that's, right. Then you'd have it available. Wanna, but yeah. that's okay. the goal. We're trying that's to fill that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, is there any way... I know Thank that there's you. so <laughs> many variables, but is there any way to get projections here on if this is successful and if it runs for the course of the school year next year, what we would anticipate in terms of... Impact? He can share with us gate... Um, Case, case numbers, yeah. but yeah. we're not sure how transparent that would be. Yeah. I mean, you could probably look at a percent increase in sales and then apply the percent increase to ours. It's exciting to think about. Yeah. Successful. Well, and it wouldn't be irresponsible yeah. to yeah. say that yeah. we're going to increase our non -tax, tax revenues from fund balance in FY20 yeah. by some small amount, knowing that we will generate that small amount in. Yeah. That's not irresponsible, and it okay. probably is a question that That's will be asked of us. Thank you for um, getting all of the answers to our questions yeah. and That's all of that work. I appreciate that. So we just need to connect to figure out what we're presenting on that budget. Yeah. So over the weekend, like between now and maybe it's the weekend, but between now and Monday, there there are still a couple of things that are in motion. So like the school board, the strategic planning. Debt service still. Debt service. So if we can at least have those ironed out by Monday, then it makes the conversation a little less mm -hmm. nebulous. Mm -hmm. Do we think it's an effective strategy to see where Tom is, um, see then if we were to get to that amended amount, what that impact would be for us? And do you want to speak to that or not? And you can think about that. Yeah. I just think there could be a way to say, like, we heard you, and this is what it would mean if we were to do that. I really and don't like that. That goes to April's point. Well, I don't and like this that. is why I don't yeah. agree with the 3% right. from April. Because well, it's right. the same sort of I think of you can emotion. do half, right? I think we always need to, we heard you. Right. Right. But they know. But I, I, want, I really want to go downstairs. We're so doing this. Excuse myself. Okay. So, four minutes. <laughs> four minutes. Can I ask? Clarifying question about that. Yeah. Is this a public comment? Uh, we have public yes. comment on the agenda. Um, so I heard them say we want the 1.3 reduction. However, we understand that the school might not have much wiggle room. I heard a couple of counselors say that. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't want us to lose sight of that as we try to do our diligence throughout this process. I mean, I think you guys have been so transparent and I think have asked more questions than I have ever seen the finance committee ask in the, in the recent future, in the recent past. And you guys really 
ask hard, thoughtful questions. Well, they, so they, I, I just, I, just I feel agree like, with you, you Amy, a hundred and ten percent, because I really do feel like the temperature of the town council is very warm and fuzzy towards the school's budget. I just, we've got to figure out where that line is, and it's the community too, right? It's mm -hmm. taking everybody's temperature all the time, just mm -hmm. to, to not go in like this is our budget, and if we cut this, this, and this, then teachers are going to be out on the streets, and they're going to be crying children. And finding a, you know, mm -hmm. a happy medium. I feel like there's no more time. Oh, I always do. Yeah. 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 So, so it's the woman who has her coat on. It. <laughs> End of meeting. Adjourned. Adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.